You have people, you know, like actors, you know, and they, that's their life. That's their job, you yes. know, and I don't know how they do it because I feel, I feel uncomfortable in front of a camera. Yeah, most of us, especially yeah. if um, um, actors, it's their job, but sometimes like most of the time now we interview people who are just part of the, the you know, the world who just influencers, but, or doctors, but they don't really they're not used to cameras but tell me i mean you've you've been doing a lot are we starting okay you wanna clap so usually i start my podcast just like that mm -hmm. uh, but i want to introduce you uh, first um, dr horia uh, horia kazim uh, you're the first woman first uh, surgeon i want to uh, clarify are you the first surgeon female in a UAE or your first breast surgeon? First female surgeon. Oh, wow. Yeah, of any kind. <laughs> of any kind. Yeah. That, that's that's amazing. Um, you've been influenced by your family, by your father. Yeah. Your father is a surgeon yeah. and uh, your mother is a fashion uh, yeah. designer. Yeah. And uh, why you didn't take that route? I did. Uh, I, all my sewing <laughs> skills come from my mom. So everybody always thinks that I'm a surgeon um, because my dad's a surgeon, but actually um, it's because my mom taught me uh, how to sew. She taught me about symmetry. She taught me about design and um, and I can sew fast, you uh -huh. know, so that that I learned from her. <laughs> so actually you're, you, you're, you have the time to do it. To what? To do that? To so do this was, you know, growing up, you mm -hmm. know, my whole life. And my mom had a business. So um, I don't, th now I look back and I think, you know, because my kids tell me, you know, if they want to do something, they don't want to do it. But, you know, in our time, if my mother said, you know, you're getting up early and you're coming into the shop this morning, I got up early and I went to the shop. And so that's what I did in my summer holidays and, and you know, winter holidays um, is I hung out in my mom's shop. Okay. And so I learned a lot, even though personally, I don't feel like I'm, you know, I know much about fashion um, or I'm not. You know, my mom's an artist as well as a, a, a fashion designer, but I don't consider myself an artist. But that eye that she's given me for, you know, how I view things, it's a very interesting perspective, except I'm looking at the human body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's nice. You studied in in different countries. You've mm -hmm. you've, uh, you've uh, been raised in in the you born in UAE yeah. and raised in the Caribbean, yeah. and then uh, went to Canada and boarding mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. and studied there. And um, part of your teachers were Irish, so you moved to um, Ireland, Ireland, yeah. and yeah. studied there the yeah. medicine. So it happened like that because my um, my father um, when he went first of all there were no um, high schools and colleges and um, so the UAE was not the UAE Dubai was part of um, the Trucial States which was a British protectorate and India those days was British part of the British Empire and so a lot of people um, went to um, to school there um, my grandfather had a Dow he was a trader and he just put his kids on the Dow and they went to Bombay and my dad went to Catholic school mm -hmm. in Bombay and then went to medical school there. He graduated in 1950. Um, the partition of India happened in 48. Mm -hmm. And so here was dad as a Muslim with British papers in a place where, you know, they didn't want either of Any those. British, yes. So <laughs> no British, no, no Muslims. So he had to look for a job. And so his older brother had graduated a couple of years before him and had married a girl who was at medical school, but she was from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And so he applied to various places those days. Um, the sort of Dubai's of the, the region was Aden. Um, he applied to um, the oil fields of Abadan in Iran. He applied to Brazil for some reason, and then he applied to Trinidad where his brother was. And that was the first answer he got. So that's mm -hmm. how we ended up all the way there. And then, you know, I, like you said, I went to boarding school in Canada and then my my GP in Canada and my dentist in Dubai were both Irish. And so they sort of insisted that that's where I was going to go to medical school. So I ended up 
in Ireland, of all places. Those days, I mean, now Ireland, of course, is uh, everybody knows it's part of the EU and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a lovely place. But at the time it was, you know, people just knew about the IRA and my mother, I remember she was like, oh, no, they have bombs. You know, you're uh -huh. not going to. I said, so my dentist was trying to say, no, that's in the north. This is in the south. And I remember her taking a map out and she goes, nah, it's close enough. You're not going. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually I think the dentist won and I did go. And then I came back here. Yes, and uh, actually you loved it. I mean, it was mm. your, your best time in, uh, in, in the uni. It was. Um, it was, I mean, I was doing because I was doing what I wanted to do, but also the college was a real mix of people. So the college I went to, a third were Irish, a third came from the developing nations, and then a third came from developed nations. So I now have friends and colleagues all over the world, mm -hmm. which was wonderful. So it was a good experience all around. And, and Ireland which to a certain degree still is, but it was a very, it was big, but it was small, you know? Mm -hmm. So you ran into people on the street that you knew. So you felt like you were part of a community, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, it was good times. After that, you went to uh, UK to uh, like an intern to apply. Um, no, I came back to Dubai first um, to do my internship here. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I went back uh, to do my surgical training. So that's where exactly. I was in the UK and, and then the you US. chose the breast uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. cancer uh, surgery. Yeah, but which didn't really exist. Mm -hmm. um, everybody was a surgeon, as most things were in the past. Everything, the surgeon did everything, even brain surgery, but even my dad. So my dad's day he could open a chest, he could do hmm. bones, he could take an appendix out, he could do everything. And slowly these things started sort of breaking away from what we now call general surgery. And because we know that if you do um, the same or similar things over and over again, you get really good at doing it. Mm -hmm. So if you are a bone surgeon, you just want to be doing bones every day and then you become a really good bone surgeon. There was no specific training. You just decided what you wanted to do and you just did it. So the, it, the, so when I graduated, there was no such thing as a breast surgeon. Even when I did my internship, though most general surgery clinics, half of them would be breast patients. Mm -hmm. So it seemed likely that that was going to be the next thing to break off. And it did. So for me, choosing um, to be to do breast surgery was actually twofold. One part of it was me seeing patients in Dubai when I was an intern that were very advanced. Um, breast cancer cases that were, I mean, I, you didn't see in textbooks. And that sort of gave me an idea. And that plus the idea that, you know, they let it, they let their disease go to such an advanced state because they didn't want to go to a male surgeon. So mm -hmm. those two things made me think, you know what, I want to do surgery. And breast was kind of there. But like I said, there wasn't such a thing as a breast mm -hmm. surgeon. And um, when I was, then I went back to the UK to get my uh, fellowship in surgery, just general surgery. And at the, towards the end of my training, I was going to come back to Dubai. And I remember thinking, I don't know enough about surgical oncology or cancer surgery. Um, I've done bits and pieces here, but I didn't really know a lot. And I knew that when I came back to Dubai, my training would kind of end. So I applied to um, the largest cancer hospital in the UK where I was working at the time. And these jobs are really hard to get. And uh, first of all, as a foreigner and as a woman in surgery. And I remember, um, so we had, you know, big formal panel interviews. And finally, um, somebody, uh, we went out and there were about 14, 15 of us there for the, uh, who were shortlisted for the job. What I didn't realize is there was more than one job at this cancer hospital. So I was one of the first names, if not the first name, they call back in. And I thought they were going to say, it's fine. Um, you know, thanks for coming thanks for the coming. interview. We're and that's gonna, it. Yeah. And what they did is they took an A4 sheet of paper that actually had the units that they were looking to hire for. And it was in alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. So this sheet just, they flung it at me and they just said, which job do you want? And I was so thrown by, first of all, them telling me I had a job. And secondly, them asking me which one I wanted. I just read the first line, which said breast Beat. unit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I remember I cried all the way home on the train because I remember thinking, oh, my God, what did I just do to myself? Um, and I thought, oh, working with women for six months, it's going to be awful. 
And first day on the job, I had one of those moments that I don't think happen very often where you just stand there and you know you are where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a really enlightening moment. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Because you wanted first to do uh, um, uh, disease uh, research and... Uh, and to, Infectious to, to, diseases in fact, is exactly. what I initially went to medical school wanting to do. And the reason for that is I liked the concept of public health, of taking care of communities as opposed to sitting in a clinic and seeing individual patients. And so my idea, you know, having grown up in the tropics of public health was kind of going off to a third world country and looking after groups of people. And so I went to medical school wanting to do infectious diseases. I thought that would be the most useful in a setting of public health in a developing country. And halfway through medical school, you know, somebody put a scalpel in my hand. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, wow, I like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how the surgery came about. But it's interesting because there were no female surgeons in Ireland when this happened. I didn't, I had not seen anybody who looked like me who was also a surgeon. So it was, you have to remember, so even me kind of going, I like this, there was nothing there that sort of showed me that I could do it. That, you know, in spite of being a woman, in spite of being a foreigner, I could be a surgeon. Um, so in a very, very roundabout way, even though I did actually leave infectious diseases behind and do, um, uh, I did general surgery and then breast surgery, but as part of being a breast surgeon, when I came back to Dubai, I do a lot of public health. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I had to do was sort of, you know, get the national consciousness um, of breast cancer into the brains of women that they need to be thinking about this. They need to be doing something. They need to be screening, not waiting to find a lump. So in a very, as I said, roundabout way, I spend a lot of my day doing public health. Mm -hmm. So I've come back to my roots in some way. And and uh, you, f you felt the need of uh, of awareness, as you as you mentioned, you, you when you were here shocked by how women leave themselves for, uh, to a later yes. stages. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is is that they don't want to see a male uh, doctor that and, the, and the modesty that they yeah. have is like it's, it's restricting them from from, you know, telling people and, yeah. and, and, and talk about the disease itself. Yes. So I think that is a big part of it the modesty um, but there's also that whole thing which we still have you know we're so superstitious about the word cancer like we don't even want to say it you know you just don't even talk about it because god forbid you'll get it if you say it yeah, you know we how say, we, we say that bismillah. Bismillah or that that uh, disease, disease yes. we don't say the name of it exactly yeah all my parents it's just like she died because she had that disease, that disease. exactly it's like, uh, so that's still there and i think that you know, and of course, you know, that puts a lot of fear into the brains of women. So the idea of the awareness was to take away the fear, to make women say, OK, you know, people get cancer, but you get cancer. And if you pick it up early, chances are you can cure it and then you can continue with your life as normal. So a lot of what I try to do, you know, nowadays, of course, it's not just me, the Internet came around the same time I mm -hmm. finished. So a lot of information was out there. I had a lot of young people taking this information home to their moms and their grandmothers. But it is the, the information, you know, it's there. But I think more powerful than that is when they see someone who's had cancer, who looks normal, mm -hmm. who has a job, who has kids, you know, who carries on. Because I think for a long time there was, you know, breast cancer or any cancer equals death. Yes. And actually, breast cancer is one of the better cancers out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when I, I tell patients, you know, the the WHO figures for cancer right now is one in three women will get some kind of cancer and one in two men will get some kind of cancer. So if and those are pretty bad numbers. So yes. if we have to get cancer, then, you know, breast is actually one of the good ones. Mm -hmm. You know, provided it's picked up early. But you said that this is the only um, most people don't talk about it, especially in the female parts, because the, the men get, get it more than the women in general cancer. Cancer, uh, yes. Like one of two men yeah. get, get cancer. Yeah. That's a big number. It's a big number. So it's not if, it's when. Oh. You know? Hmm. And as I said, now uh, most cancers are on the increase around the world. We don't really know why. Um, but the good news with breast in particular is that even though breast cancer incidence is, is rising, the death rate is dropping faster. 
And a lot of that is part of that is picking it up early because with all the screening, because of all the awareness. And part of that, I think a bigger part in some ways is because we treat it better. So now, you know, it's not just breast cancer. We now look at the biology of cancers. We look at the genetics of your cancer mm -hmm. and we treat your tumor specifically. We're not saying, okay, all women who have breast cancer get this, no. So everything is now targeted to the biology of the disease that you have, mm -hmm. which has been a great, great thing. And is there many, many variant of, uh, of, of cancer? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the question to you also, it differs from one region to another, like in, in USA is different from the yeah. Africa or the Middle East and, and, and the people who are getting it. Um, our age uh, group is different. smaller than, than the... It is, it is. And that part we are not completely sure about. So breast cancer tends to be a disease that you see a lot of in what we call the West. So North America, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand. Um, but when you look at the incidence of breast cancer in those regions, the median age of breast cancer is about 62 or 63. And when you look at the UAE and the entire Middle East, North Africa region and the Indian subcontinent, it's in the mid 40s. Mm -hmm. So it's almost two decades younger, um, which is kind of scary because if you think about what a woman's doing in her mid 40s, she's at the peak of her career. She has a young family that mm -hmm. she's taking care of. It's not it's not the same as dealing with somebody who's 62. Not to say, you know, that we don't take care of a woman who's 62, mm -hmm. but it's a completely different emotion um, when dealing with patients that are that, that young. are younger. Yeah. Yes. But um, uh, I don't know if this is our lifestyle, the way mm. we live, if it mm. affects the, 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 the uh, probably because we do see that um, there are a couple of different studies. So we have some studies where we look at, for example, Japanese women who have a relatively lower incidence of breast cancer. They have other cancer. They have you know high stomach cancer rates, but mm. their breast cancer rates are relatively low. But when you look at Japanese women who immigrate to San Francisco, which has a high incidence, um, within one generation, these Japanese women now have the incidence rate of their adoptive country. Mm. So we know it must be something lifestyle, something environmental. Yeah. But I think also because when I tell you that, you know, our age group is so much younger, it's not just ours in the UAE, it's the whole Middle East, North Africa and Indian subcontinent. So you start thinking there's something genetic going on mm -hmm. because we don't look like people from the West. We're different. So do we, is there something wrong with our DNA or something in our DNA that makes us more prone to the effects of environmental carcinogens, lifestyle carcinogens, yeah. you know, we don't know. Um, I heard that breastfeeding can uh, reduce the the, um, the percentage of you, you getting uh, breast cancer, breast cancer yeah. due to uh, change of hormones and the, and the period uh, that, that, that will stop during yes, the pregnancy. Exactly, exactly. And um, yeah. so so in the Arab wars, we, we bring more exactly. more kids. So why is that? We like, bring kids, we breastfeed Islamically for two years, mm -hmm. each kid, and still you get breast cancer. So those studies that say that that um, breastfeeding um, prevents breast cancer, that's when you look at large groups of women. Obviously, even in the West, you have women who breastfeed and, and still get breast cancer. So I think cancer is more complicated than you did this or you didn't do this. I think it's a combination of things that we have to look at. Yes. Tell me more about you. You've um, when when you, when you, uh, you went uh, by coincidence. You didn't choose um, uh, bre breast surgery. It shows mm -hmm. you kind of. Mm -hmm. You saw it on the paper and yes, and, uh, the universe. No, I the believe universe. the universe puts you where you're meant to be. Exactly, <laughs> and you you've been one of the the first uh, female surgeon. And mm -hmm. for for a, a, the co coincidence is the first surgeon was hundred years uh, uh, ago when you have uh, when I got my fellowship. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it's it's something. Uh, and there weren't that many in that hundred years. Mm -hmm. So the first one, so in the UK and Ireland, we we do um, uh, we get a fellowship in surgery that qualifies us as a surgeon or to call ourselves a surgeon. 
And there, th this is done through the Royal College of Surgeons, and there are four of them. So the one that had the first female was the one in Ireland, yeah. uh, in interestingly, and it was exactly a hundred years. So it took hundred years to see a female surgeon in the Middle East yeah. or in, 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 UAE, the, in the UAE. In UAE. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and but to be fair, even in those parts of the world, I mean, if, if, when I looked at the numbers from Ireland, you know, so that that woman who um, who became a surgeon in, in 1893, um, then th then there were many years that were dry that mm. no woman became a surgeon, you know. Um, so it was it, even when I got my fellowship in 1993, at that point, um, two percent of surgeon cons surgical consultants so at the top of their game basically in the uk were women um in america 10 percent. so and it's not that long ago i mean 30 years to have it was only 10 percent, and it was two percent in in the uk and ireland and um, a couple years ago they audited the the female surgeons in ireland and it had gone up to something like seven percent <laughs> so Yes, the trajectory is in the right direction. <laughs> there is a lot of sacrifice to be a, it is. a, a surgeon. You, you have uh, waited nine years to get married. Yes. Uh, you were engaged for nine years. Yes. And yes. Uh, you, it is, it is, it, it is. And, and and I tell people, so a lot of what I do right now, apart from, you know, the hat that I wear as a, as a, as a breast surgeon is I actually do a lot of mentoring to kids in medical school and even in high schools, trying to let them see what I didn't see. That I can be, and you know, I'm I'm just an ordinary woman. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not like some, you know, smart person, the smartest person in the world. But the fact that I can see something that I like and go after it and not have my gender or my nationality prevent that from happening. So I do a lot of trying to talk to um, uh, female medical students, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm honest with them. It's not an easy road. There is a reason why there aren't so many female surgeons even today. You know, if it's only gone from 2% to 7%, I mean, that's not a lot. And we, they, we looked at, in those numbers, we looked to see where were the drops happening because in medical school, half the medical school are women. By the time you get to surgical training, it was down to 34%. So there was already a drop, a drop yeah. of, of women, on female what, medical on students. On what age uh, approximately? Do you so this would have been, they would have been now in their early 20s, mm -hmm. um, thinking that for some reason, feeling that this was not a viable option for them. And then there was a huge drop from training, which is really quite scary because you've put in all that time, you've put in all that effort and then not make it to consultant level. Mm. And that's the age where you want to start having a family. A family, exactly. And it should not be that these two things are mutually exclusive. Yes, you do have to carry the children, um, you know, biologically, that's how we're made. But it should be that you, that there are some things that are helpful for you to be able to carry out both duties. When I first came back to Dubai, I tried to find a part-time job. I tried to find uh, flexible working hours. Everybody looked at me like I'd fallen off some mm. alien planet. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you're either working or you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it, yeah, so those kind of things are important, you know? And I know people say, why should we make, you know, exceptions? And I'm sorry, you know, you just do. You, you do, and if somebody is, is, uh, is, is uh, a paraplegic, you build a ramp so mm -hmm. that, you know, is everybody a paraplegic? No, but you want to make sure that everybody has a way around in this world. And so if we did things like in America, for example, if the big hospitals have a nursery so you could actually keep your baby there and in your lunch break, you can go and breastfeed. So you don't feel like, you know, I'm, I'm either a mother or I'm a surgeon. No, I can do both. But it's also for a middle Middle Eastern uh, woman is slightly difficult because the demands from the man is is higher. It is. And then uh, I want I want to have more children. I want I want you to stay at home and and uh, yeah. raise them. And you're right because uh, I, I you know my I was not okay. So I am the first female surgeon, but I was not the first to try. There were women ahead of me, and it's those kind of things that prevented them from reaching their true potential because of all the stresses and the needs 
of husbands and families. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the part that I tell the girls in medical school that you have to be ready to just, you know, stand firm and say, no, nope, this is what I want to do. But they also have to know that it may mean them getting married late or um, bring children late, or bringing like, children like, late like, like me, like you, you had yeah. the, your first child at 41, 41. Yeah. And that I wouldn't say that's ideal, but that's just how it happened. And alhamdulillah, I was I managed to have two kids. But yeah, that's not it doesn't go with our society and the whole thing of like and even getting married late, you know, here, you know how it is here. Mm. You reach 25, you're like geriatric. Nobody wants to marry. Yeah. You after 25. <laughs> yes. Do you feel that this is the this is the thing that makes the difference in, in the in the gender uh, pay, pay uh, gap? Um, do, you, do you feel that that's the reason the family, the kids, the the reason why woman is is fighting and uh, not getting enough uh, uh, in the pay, in, in the pay payback? I can't, you know, I work for myself right now, so I can't comment on that. Mm -hmm. I remember when I did work uh, for the government, there was a difference um, for some women who were married. Um, Uh, in things like housing allowances and stuff because they would say well your husband's getting the housing allowance mm -hmm. and it's like I'm sorry it doesn't matter I, I let it be two allowances because we're both working we both deserve whatever is due to us but for me you know I, I came back and because I couldn't find a, a, a job um, people didn't know what I did because as I said breast surgery was was such a new thing they said are you a breast surgeon are you a plastic surgeon mm. and um, and so I ended up working for myself um, which is fine and I so I don't notice the, the 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 gap but there are other things I think you know the getting married and those issues I don't think for most um, professions that's an issue um, I think we've come a long way here in terms of and to be honest I never had anybody telling me here that you're a woman you can't be a surgeon on the contrary mm -hmm. here I actually had people telling me we need a female surgeon and so I didn't have I had it more when I was in the west actually yeah. of people making me reminding me of my gender or reminding me uh, that you know I'm not from there But here I didn't. And I feel like in, in, in most jobs, I think things have improved. I think there's still other issues that, that we have that are related to the gender gap index that, that we have here. And a lot of that I know they're trying to address. Things like, for example, that I have myself is, you know, being able to give nationality to my children um, as I've married a non UAE citizen. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. And it's a big deal for my kids because they're born and brought up here. So to all intents and purposes, in their mind, they're Emirati, but in real life, it's not so, you know, there are things, uh, there are um, uh, things that, that, you know, as an Emirati, you, the government gives you. Um, I was on an educational scholarship for all of my uh, uh, training abroad. Um, uh, you get housing, uh, like you get a house, all Emirati. I can't get those things because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, and because I've married a non, if I'd married a local, then obviously a local would get it. And uh, marrying a non-local, I don't get housing. I don't get uh, my kids don't get education. So I think those are the important things. And I think the passport issue is a big issue in the gender gap. And that's for the whole Middle East. I think there's only two or three countries of the 22 that allow women to pass their nationality to their children. Lebanon may be one of them. Uh, I, I, I doubt. And I mean, Lebanon, we have the same problems. Uh, women cannot cannot give. Oh, really? Uh, it can for some countries, unfortunately, yes. but there are some countries where they 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 think it's um, it's kind of like we have more immigrants coming from the neighbors. So mm. we don't want to give the nationality of that neighbor. But if you are uh, American, then you're welcome. <laughs> But if you're a neighbor. No, you're not really. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like um, yeah. because in Lebanon, you know, there is a lot of uh, there is different in in religion and this and they don't want they don't want to mix uh, yeah and I understand that and because yeah. here you know basically things like inheritance is is on the father's side of the family so it would mean um, my children have my father's have their father's nationality so it means if I have a house and and I die then my house now goes to another national 
mm-hmm. even though it's my children, mm-hmm. but technically to another national. So I think that's, I think, you know, first of all, the UAE is such a new country. I think they're figuring it out as they go. And I think we've done really well in 50 years. Um, but I think those are the things, and I can see that they are um, addressing the things that are causing us to be at the bottom of this gender gap. <laughs> I'm sure it, it will be addressed and it, it yeah. will be something. It's, uh, everything is uh, that has a start and UAE started the, the whole uh, country, the whole uh, education system, the whole streets, everything from, from scratch. And, uh, yeah. and, the, and the development that has been here is, is major and it's great. I'm sure it will reach to uh, the point so. where, it's, uh, where, yeah. where it satisfies most people. Uh, talking of the family, you mm-hmm. treat a lot of uh, p- part of your family and and um, your big family as well. And you had an incident where you just like, sometimes don't charge them <laughs> and then they pay you by by sending some gifts. Tell me I more know. about that. Oh, I love that. Well, <laughs> when we were in the Caribbean, I remember my dad used to get paid in, in sacks of uh, grapefruits and pumpkins and, you know, whatever people could pay. And I think and that, of course, goes back to, you know, probably the ancient Greeks where you you traded, you bartered, you know. But I you w- had some expensive purse. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but it was expensive surgery that yes. I did, so it's okay. Yeah, so now I get paid in, in Chanel handbags sometimes, so <laughs> Louis Vuitton, um, and which is lovely. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it, it's a perk of the job, I guess, yes. you know. But, but um, Talking to the emotional side of, of treating a family, mm-hmm. there is there is a lot of pressure on you as like you want to treat somebody that you know. And um, I don't know if you always say yes or no for somebody who who might uh, put a lot of, um, you know, uh, stress or, or or feeling like uh, um, um, is it going to succeed or, or is is there any any, um, you know, uh, worry when you when you treat somebody from your family? I think there is initially. But, you know, when you're in an operating room and I don't know if we do this on purpose, you know, the patient is completely covered. We don't see the gender. We don't see, you know, who this patient is. And when you go in there as a surgeon, you know, you go in there with the mindset that I am the best person to do this job for this person, regardless of who the person is. So when I see them in the clinic, of course, the the emotional side is there because you're speaking to someone that you're related to. But when you're actually in the operating room, you know, we treat everybody the same as no difference. Um, And I don't be I'm not thinking it's my family, you know. Having said that, you know, and of course, you know, Dubai, everybody's related to everybody. So Mm -hmm. everybody is a family. But would I want to operate on my own daughter? Probably not. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's probably where I would I would draw the line. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of uh, emotional pressure. And tell me what's the hardest part of your uh, job? And I'm I'm sure it's it it shouldn't be inside the 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 surgery room. It's uh, it's it's outside that. It is. It is. So and and you know it's it's a two-edged sword because somebody asked me recently you know do you miss operating when you go on holiday and actually I don't and I thought about what do I miss I do miss work but not the actual operating not taking a knife and cutting people open I miss my patients I miss talking to them and we spend a lot of time counseling I tell people I'm more psychiatrist than surgeon I spend a lot more time talking And, you know, for all of you out there who has had a report card that said you talk too much, if your teachers say you talk too much or you're a chatterbox, that was my report card every single year. Um, And nobody saw that as a positive that I now make a living off of talking. You have to. (laughs) I mean, they need you. This is the, uh, the they only see you as a person who is like telling them the truth and helping them you're you're the only person they want to talk to you and if they, even if they talk to uh, to to the part of the family it's not going to satisfy them as much how much this is putting pressure as well on you uh, to be a psychologist uh, yeah it does and you do take a lot of it on and it's not just the patient because you now you know obviously the disease of the patient affects the whole family It affects the husband, it affects the children, it affects the mother and father. And so it's a very, very emotive subject that, you know, dealing with cancer. Um, As a surgeon, I'm lucky, you know, I see the patient at the beginning of their journey. Um, So my job is really to instill hope in everybody, to let them know, yes, they have that disease, the C word, Mm -hmm. but 
you know, here's what we can do and here's what the likely outcome is. So, and as I said, breast is, breast cancer is one of the good cancers. So I'm not lying when I tell patients that yes, it's a long road, but you know, you're going to be fine in the end. Um, but it's, it's tough, but you know, it's tougher for them. Mm. They're the ones going through it, you know? But you think it's the telling the truth is the, is the best yes. way and, and telling the whole, the whole truth. Yeah. And you know, here, especially when I first came back, you know, I would have, you know, family members telling me like, don't tell them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how can I not tell them? You know, if somebody has to have chemo and their hair is falling out, what am I going to tell them? Yeah. Tell them they have iltihab. Mm. So I said, like, in, they have inflammation. I was like, but it's not inflammation when mm. your hair doesn't drop out and you have inflammation, you know. So I think that's gotten better because we we know from studies that if you hide things from people, Women are smart. I don't care how educated or uneducated, old or young. Women are very intuitive human beings and they know their body. They know what's actually happening. And if they think you're holding something back, then they think it's worse than it is. And that's why you're holding it back. So I always think it's better. Look, nobody wants to be, you know, nobody wants, to, you don't want to tell your, your mother or your sister that you've got cancer. But in the end, I think it, it is the kindest thing to do because then they know everybody's up front and, you know, they know the truth and they know what the likely outcome is, which hopefully is something good. Yeah, it's um, let's go through the, the, pr the procedure of uh, first, how do you discover as a woman, how do you discover that you might have a cancer now of course through mammogram which i want to ask you mm. about is mammogram first dangerous by it's, by itself to to have on its own in... no it's not i mean obviously mammograms are have uh, radiation mm -hmm. and we don't you know use radiation willy-nilly um but you you know we what people don't realize is if you get on a plane and fly to new york you get as much radiation as is in a mammogram mm -hmm. um but nobody but you, they don't give no, you the results there <laughs> and, well this is it so i tell people well if you're so worried about radiation then don't fly mm -hmm. stay home never go on holiday again and they go what and i'm going yeah so which is more important um so no on its own you know the, the dosing that we give the way that we can now um focus the radiation where we want it to go it is probably the best way of picking up a cancer so mm. obviously what we're doing is trying to pick up a cancer by imaging before you can feel anything there mm -hmm. um if that's not the case then the the commonest thing that i get if a woman is picking it up herself is a lump in the breast it's mm -hmm. usually a painless lump in the breast some women will see um, a nipple discharge that's blood um but by far the, the commonest thing is feeling a lump or just feeling that the breast feels lumpier than normal. Um, and then what we do is uh, we do something called a triple assessment. We examine you, we feel it because um, some, some, the majority of lumps are actually not cancer. So you get an idea by examining. Then we take pictures, then we'll do the mammograms. Uh, sometimes we do ultrasounds, MRIs, and then we'll, we will do a biopsy to confirm. And this is a needle mm -hmm. that takes a sample that tells us what it is. So that's our triple assessment. In medicine, you'll find that if you have to do that many things to diagnose mm. one problem, it means none of them are perfect, right? Because if my, hand yeah. if my hands were perfect, I wouldn't have to do a scan or I wouldn't yeah. have to do a so biopsy. So you have to do the three, three so assessments. you have to do all three. Mm -hmm. None of them are perfect, but hopefully the resulting picture of mm -hmm. the three together gives you something close to 100% that you know. It's never quite 100, but close to 100% that you know what kind of lump this is. Yeah, is the needle the dangerous as well? Like, cause it's might like, it's like, uh, you know, the bees, when you, when you touch them, they will fly. <laughs> and, and that's Don't cancer. like that picture. <laughs> <laughs> does cancer get, let's say, irritated or- As far or, or, as or, we know uh, not. I mean, I think, Cancers are a bit smarter than that. If cancers want to spread, and again, this goes back to the biology of the tumor. Some, some tumors are aggressive by their nature. They're born aggressive. They're not waiting for you to put a needle in hmm. to spread. If it wants to spread, it's going to spread. 
Um, so no, but I do hear people saying that and I can see, I, I can have that visual like you just did, which I never quite heard about the bees, but I know what you mean. I've, I've kind of <laughs> Don't touch them. <laughs> I know that you irritate it and you're going to spread it. That's what people think. But so far as we know now, it's not the case. Yes. And um, so it's the early uh, checkup is mm -hmm. the best exactly. thing. And then uh, or either the woman can discover by, by coincidence that she having a lump. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the other stages? So the, there's always a, like the surgery and is there uh, and, the, and the chemotherapy? Yeah. Uh, so we treat um, basically uh, for, for breast cancer pretty much everybody gets surgery mm -hmm. at some point, and I'll tell you the types of surgery in a bit. Um, some people get chemotherapy, not everybody. Some people get radiation, not everybody. And some people get hormone therapy. Those are the big things. We have other things that we use like targeted therapy, immunotherapy, but generally in those little boxes. Surgery is, um, a, a lot of people think if I have a tumor, I have to lose my breast, mm. and that's not the case. Um, the majority of the time we can save the breasts, um, but sometimes uh, we remove the breasts if the tumor is too big in relation to the size of the breast, or if there's more than one tumor in the breast, or if the tumor is stuck to the nipple or something like that. Um, or sometimes patients want a mastectomy. Hmm. Um, and, and I think that is also a good reason. If a patient says to me, you know, you can do all these things, but if at the end of the day I know I have a breast, I will get breast cancer again. Mm. Um, even though that's not our perspective from a medical point of view. From a medical point of view, we are not worried about a lump in the breast coming back. People don't die because you have a lump in the breast. You die because the lump goes, the, the t cells go somewhere else, right? It goes to the liver, mm -hmm. it goes to the bone. So we, that's the thing that we worry about. We don't worry about you having another cancer. And obviously it's disappointing to us, it's disappointing to the patient mm -hmm. if you get another cancer or you get a recurrence in your breast. But from a prognosis point of view, we're not worried because we know we can sort it. It's when it spreads somewhere else, then you know that's what we mm -hmm. call stage four disease. That's incurable. So, so it's their decision to decide. It to, can be their decision. So hmm. I give them the perspective, our perspective as a medical person, but I do take that on board. If a patient says to me, I have them, you know, in the beginning, every patient will say, cut both off. I don't want anything. Mm -hmm. As time goes and we explain, you know, how breast cancer actually works, um, then people may change their mind and decide, you know what, if I can have a lumpectomy, have less surgery, less complications, I'll go for that. Some people don't have a choice. So, or some people, as I said, choose to do it. Now, if we remove the breasts, it used to be um, up until say the late 90s, um, if we remove the breast, you would be completely flat with a big line across your chest and you would wear um, a, a prosthesis or a false breast in your undergarments. Nowadays, when we do a mastectomy, what we try to do is little hidden incisions that you don't see and we try to save the skin and save the nipple and we literally go inside and scoop the breast tissue out and then the plastic surgeon and yourself yeah. decides what you're gonna fill it with. And then when you look down at your chest, what you see is something that looks no, like your breast or sometimes even better mm -hmm. because we can nip tuck it yeah. while we're at it. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of plastic surgery, does this any by any way affects the, the the woman or the procedure when you or when you find a woman she's already having a uh, implant mm -hmm. plastic uh, mm -hmm. su surgery does this uh, be on the way of, of treating or affecting the no not really um because usually when you have an implant put in um for to make your breast bigger say you've done this cosmetic surgery before and then you know god forbid later on you get a cancer so that silicone prosthesis is put either behind the breast tissue or behind the muscle that's behind the breast tissue. So it's actually not in the way. So even for doing a lumpectomy or just removing the tumor, we can do that and leave your leave your implant where it is. Um, if we're doing a mastectomy, you already have a nice pocket there for us. Mm. So we just kind of redo it a bit, just removing the breast tissue. So actually, no, it doesn't it doesn't bother us in any way that that uh, that that's there. 
Okay, um, tell me more about the survivors, mm-hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the people that you meet after the, they have uh, g- done the surgery or the, done the treatment. Tell me more, how, how much do they change? How uh, uh, what are the most uh, significant things about their personality? I think they do change. And you know, what's interesting is you would think that the ones, say, who had to remove their breast would have more psychological issues than the than the ones who just did a lumpectomy. And they actually find that that's not true. What they find, the things that cause um, psychological upset in breast cancer women is the fact that they have cancer. Mm-hmm. It is the C word. It's not about chopping off their breasts or not chopping off their breasts, saving it, not saving it. It's the fact that they have had cancer. And I find with my patients, there is that initial shock, of course. And then you start to try, you start on your journey, the treatment journey, which is intense and long. And so every week, sometimes every three weeks, every two weeks, you're seeing somebody in a hospital or clinic. And then finally you get to the end and you're done. And then the doctor says, I'll see you in three months. And that's when it hits them because it's sort of like, wait, what, three months? (laughs) I thought I'm done. I know. Well, also because, you know, I think because they didn't, you just, you keep going, you get, you go into automatic pilot and you just keep going for this treatment, for this treatment. And finally you get three months to think about, oh my God, what did I just go through? So, and I think that's normal, that's Mm -hmm. natural. I mean, nobody goes through it and, and comes out and goes, yay, I had cancer. I'm so glad I had chemo and nobody does that. So it's normal to have that. And it is a grieving process. And like grief for anything, losing a family member or losing a job, losing a home, you have to go through all the different stages. You have to get depressed. You have to get angry. You have to, you know, question everything that you've done or eaten or smoked or drank or whatever. And then finally, you will get to that acceptance stage. Um, Obviously, there is depression along the way as well. That's part of the grieving process. But what we hope to do, so in addition to the actual physical treatment that we give, is we try to offer Mental, yes, uh, treatment. a psychological And on treatment. the bright side, how do they change? In the, in, on the, on well, the, on the bright side, I, mm. what they tell me is that they, um, all the little things that they would sweat about, all the little things that they would worry about, don't worry them anymore. And I think that's not a bad thing. It's something that we tell ourselves to do, but we don't actually do it. But they do. They start to enjoy life more. Enjoy life and know that, you know, okay, if the taxi is late, it's late. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to get angry about it or whatever. So I think and and what I've seen with these women um, is that is how strong they are. You know, um, sometimes I get women who come in to see me who are very traditional, who don't even talk. You know, the husband does all the talking. I mean, everything. No matter, I'll talk to the woman, say, okay, how old were you when you had your first child? Or how, you know, and the husband's doing mm-hmm. all the answering. And the problem with this treatment journey is he can't do it for her. She has to do it. And she goes through this. She goes through her chemo, her radiation, her surgery, everything. And what I see at the end is an empowered woman. You know, she she marches into my clinic. She talks to me. She leaves him out in the waiting room. Because she's done it alone. That's her own problem. And I think she's shown herself how strong she is and is not afraid to show the world how strong she Mm -hmm. is. And and I tell you, it takes my breath away. Sometimes I'm like, wow, look at her. (laughs) You've raised, uh, you've made a charity. uh, It's it's called uh, Breast Friends. Breast Friends. And you call it Best Friends? No, it's it's kind of a play on the The words breast breast and best. Uh, So it's Breast Friends. And one of the ladies picked it, picked that. Um, And basically it started as a charity and a support group. Mm -hmm. So we run a group um, of breast cancer patients. We meet, we have regular meetings. Um, It's a very informal group. This is what they wanted. So they chat, they mingle, they eat, uh, have coffee and tea. And then sometimes we will have um, a talk, a dance class, a trip. And we now, uh, the Breast Friends, the charity, um, is also in partnership with uh, the Al Jalila Foundation, and as part of that, we've also we now have a cancer drop-in center, mm-hmm. and this is for women with any cancer. 
that they can come in to get information about their disease, to get information about um, wh what treatments are available, what resources are out there for things like buying a wig or buying undergarments um, when you're wearing a prosthesis or sometimes just to hang out and have coffee and, and do, I think the last, I just saw an ad advertisement for the drop-in centers having a flower arranging class and sometimes we do yoga classes. And so um, we're trying to, because that is the most important, I think, you know, you go through that part of, you know, the chemo and the radiation, the surgery, and that's over. Mm -hmm. But the survivorship issues are important and that goes on for life. And then these women now help other women who yes. are just diagnosed and they're amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And You've uh, met some of them. Of so course, you know. <laughs> of course. And how do you see the UAE uh, advancing in, in that particular uh, uh, part in, in uh, and, and UAE women, let's uh, talk, or the women in the region. The, you find that the younger women are going now uh, to check their... Uh, they are. The, uh, and um, they are more talking about it. Uh, talking of breast friends, you, you said that people were afraid to say the word breast as well, like they would say chest. Yes. Place. Yes, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to call myself a breast surgeon yeah. um, because you couldn't say it. And now I see it every October. You'll see all you know advertisements. You'll see buses with the word breast, yes. on it, which is fantastic. And I think you know, as I said before, the whole you know the internet has helped. You know, because the information's out there, and young people are on there all mm -hmm. the time, um, and then they take the information home. And I think you know. I think in healthcare, there is an evolutionary process. You know, I tell people all the time that, you know, my father was a surgeon, but I was taken as a child to the dentist when I had a toothache. Now, you know, I know in one generation, my kids have been going to the dentist since they're about, you know, since the teeth came out. And every six months to this day, they go to the dentist. Just to check. Up. Just to check. Mm -hmm. We don't wait until something's wrong. You you go and, and you're, you're proactive about. And so the whole concept of being proactive about your health in general is a new concept everywhere. The fact that we wear seatbelts now, you know, mm. that, you know, when I grew up, we were standing up in the back of the car <laughs> and jumping around and, you know, so there is an evolutionary process. I think we're definitely on the road from that point of view. I remember distinctly, and this would have been about maybe 15 years ago, the first time a local woman sat in front of me and when I said, OK, what's the problem? And she said, nothing. I just want to be checked. And I remember thinking, really? Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it does. And, and to see that and to see, um, you know, where now I don't see that those those cases that I saw as an intern, you know, thank God, I don't see those cases anymore um, is, is actually quite incredible that in one doctor's lifetime, I've seen such a big change mm -hmm. that it is possible. People keep saying like, you know, it, it's not possible to change. It is possible. I've seen the change myself. And I'm, it's not just me, obviously. Mm. It's, as I said, the internet's there. There are lots of people doing the same things that I do, but that you can do it in such a short period of time that I can go from those horrible cases to now having somebody say, I just want to be checked. That's amazing. Do you it think we, we will reach one day to to have this disease as, as something that we cure? Easily. I do. I do think that. And I think we're very close. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of work being done all hmm. over the world. But, you know, what we've been wanting to push, and this is why the partnership with Al Jalila has been great, um, is that uh, part of their mission is locally based research, like funding research in the region, mm -hmm. because we have a different disease. Um, we get it younger, we get it, we get more aggressive types of cancer. So it's difficult to take the studies that are being done in the West and extrapolate them here. We need to do studies here, uh, specifically on genetics and those things are ongoing. So I'm, I'm excited. Yes, that yeah. are related to our cancer. Exactly, in the, in the <laughs> exactly. Uh, stem cells, is, is it something that in the future might construct kind of like uh, missing parts of our body? Just a, it's a general uh, oh question my gosh, I that got. I have no idea. But yeah. yeah, that's way out of Like my, something yeah. on the future? No, Can no, no idea. From, Not yet. From breast cancer, no. <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, well, I don't know. I mean, we, we hear about things and we hear about, you know, cloning and, and 3D uh, printing of body parts and things, which I think is kind of exciting. But so far with breast cancer, on a day-to-day -day basis, no. <laughs> uh, 
Dr. Huria, um, it's it's my pleasure. This was not my uh, area, but I wanted to highlight. You did a great job. Oh, thanks I a lot. I was impressed with your knowledge. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot. I wanted to highlight in on October uh, month uh, this um, because I I had the opportunity to work with mm-hmm. some survivors and it it's uh, really affected me emotionally. And then I need to to speak about it. And uh, it was really a pleasure having you Thank on you. my podcast. Thank you. Thanks a Thank lot you for so coming. Much. My pleasure. And if I miss anything, if you want to say anything, let me know. No, I think that's it. I think the most important is everybody um, get a check and not just of their breast. I tell everybody that this is the breast is part of your body and it's about body awareness, you know, that just knowing what your body looks like. And if you ever see any change or you're not sure, then go and see somebody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm.